Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 86. TidyX is a screencast where we go through and explain how our code works. My name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at Ellis underscore Hughes. And my name is Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And you can find the both of us on Twitter at, at Tidy underscore explained. Or hit us up on Gmail, tidy.explained at gmail.com. Or open an issue on the GitHub repo. Or as we always like, if you can like and subscribe on the YouTube channel, drop a comment or a question, and we will uh, get to it maybe in an upcoming episode. And today we have a third uh, window. A special our, guest, if you will. On will. our screen. <laughs> yeah. We're super excited to have her. Yeah. This is Julia Silgi. <laughs> Hey. Hello, I'm so glad to be here. We're, we are thrilled to have you uh, here. So for the last several months now, we've been learning about Tidy Models, how Tidy Models works, uh, making blunders as we go, figuring it out, having a, a, a grand old time. I think our audience has enjoyed it as well. Uh, but now we want to kind of wrap up what we're doing here with Tidy Models and end it with one of the authors of Tidy Models. I'm I'm been so excited to hear about um, you all, uh, you know, walking through tidy models, um, learning, getting started with it, and um, and I I mean I always really love hearing about people, you know, getting exposed to it, uh, using it in their real world work, um, hearing about what. Um, you know, what strikes people as like, oh, like I love that concept or like, oh, I, this isn't clear to me. Like, where can I go to learn more about this or and just really understand how people are um, using it? Yeah. Uh, awesome. So, Patrick, uh, do you want to get get us started? Yeah. Well, speaking of getting started and, um, you know, trying to get acquainted with tidy models or get acquainted with anything for the the uh, the viewers, you went from a PhD in astronomy to data science. How did you, how did you cross that chasm? Cause they're sort of different worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. So I do think a lot, a lot of people who are, um, have, you know, have been in data science for about as long as I have do, I think you will find a lot of people with like really sort of random, PhDs in something, you know, like, like I have a PhD in linguistics, I have a PhD in, um, you know, astrophysics or, uh, you know, some things like that. Um, and I, you know, that's, that's becoming less and less true. You know, people who are coming in now to the field um, at more entry level positions, I think, have um, uh, more, more, have, have degrees and um, training that is more specific to like these, this, this role of data scientists. Um, and I, I think this points to the, a little bit of maturing of this role and a little bit of um, the professionalization of this role and a little bit of like the reduction of this kind of like Wild West feeling um, that has been <laughs> um, in this field for, for a while. But, but yeah, I, um, my, um, my undergrad degree is in physics, my PhD is in astronomy, me. Um, and that was quite a while ago, <laughs> those degrees. I, um, I, I was in, um, I, I did teaching and research in academia for a while, um, you know, like just like squarely within kind of like the astronomy world. Um, mm -hmm. I eventually, I eventually decided like academia was not for me um, and, and left, but that was actually not when I entered into data science. I, I sort of like then ended up on this a bit of a winding path. Um, this winding path ended up with me um, as a as a like a stay at home mom for a few years. It ended up with me like a startup where uh, like an ed tech startup that was like acquired. It ended up with me being like laid off from a job and thinking like, uh, what had just happened? <laughs> like I that this this sucked, yeah. you know, and then um, uh, uh, I, w I was I was rehired to the same company after I was laid off as like as a contractor. And like that sort of that particular moment actually for me was like, wait, um, what like what do I want to be doing? Uh, it, w it was kind of like a, at a time in my own life when um, uh, things were somewhat stable in my spouse's career. My kids were you know, we were kind of out of like the teeny tiny baby stage. And I like, I was like, wait, what do I want to be doing now? What do I want to be doing? 
you know, when I turned 40, you know, and, and I, th this, this was also like at a really, like fortunately for me at a time when people with my kind of um, quantitative background were entering into um, jobs at, with this title data scientist, you know, like I started hearing about a couple of friends who are having these jobs and they were telling me, yeah, I like write code, analyze data and I make data visualization and I write about it and like communicate with people about these, um, you know, about these results. And, and I thought like, what? That was my favorite part. Like that's my favorite <laughs> part of black when I was doing research, like, um, there's a job for that now, you know? Yeah. And, um, so I, so so at that point, I, um, I I took a little time to like update the the specific programming languages that I knew. Like I, I had like a pretty um, extensive uh, quantitative and computational background, but um, did not know maybe some of the specific modern um, data science languages. So it took a little time to update those skills, and then um, and then I made this transition into data science. Wow. I mean, that, that sounds like an awesome like, career path. You've got a lot of experience with things. Um, I mean, that, that sounds like a lot of very, very interesting to me. Uh, what do you do now? So I now work at um, our studio. So I've been there for coming up on two years now. And um, my, so my title there is software engineer, which is interesting. It's my first time to have that title. Um, <laughs> and so like kind of like sitting with that and thinking about, oh, yeah, that, like I'm actually paid now to write software um uh one way to, for me to kind of like that i like to talk like maybe tell people about this like you know like what do i do now um when i was a data scientist you know like analyzing data in an org i, I spent i would say like um 80 percent of my time um analyzing data um and say 20% of my time building tools, either internal tools or um, open source software. And now um, at our studio, as like someone working on open source software as a software engineer, I'd say like it is now switched where I, I now spend 80% of my time building tools for other people to use and like 20% of my time analyzing data, either um, uh, you know, like as dog fooding or um, as uh, for teaching purposes or demonstration purposes or um, or, or sometimes because I actually do need some data analyze. <laughs> <laughs> what? When does that yeah, happen? What? Weird. <laughs> that, that's awesome. I think, you know, in a second we're going to jump into some code, but I think what's really cool is you said you did some time in academia and you felt like academia and teaching wasn't for you. But you're a teacher now, <laughs> and your blog is is right. It's teaching people, um, which I think is really important. Uh, it's like the whole teach a teach a man to fish, blah blah blah. Uh, you're teaching people a workflow, and that's really what kind of tidy models lends itself to. And I think that's probably a, of our tidy model series. That this will be a great way to wrap up is to have you one of the, the software engineers behind it, you know, you know how the sausage is made, kind of walk us through a workflow and, uh, and that'd be super cool for people watching to kind of get a sense for how you think about these things, the person who helped create it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, when I, when I think back, like, over my, like, career, like, long term, um, I do see these threads, like, that some of the things that have always been really important to me, and that have always made me um, have a lot of, uh, um, that I've been drawn to, or they have had a lot of fulfillment from, um, and some of those things, those themes are, um, I care a lot, I, I care a lot about, um, uh, how people do their work in the real world, like um, like really practical, applied kind of um, work, and I and I care a lot about like um, process and um, systems, and I um, and how um, like how we can build tools to um, improve those processes or systems, and um, I mean it's, it is one of the reasons why I. Uh, I I really love working on tidy models. So like tidy models as a piece of software is is um, like its main. It's it's not so much about like um, 
uh, here are these, it's not like, like, ah, I'm, we're going to make like brand new statistical methods. Like, like that's not the focus of tidy models. The focus of tidy models is, Hey, Hey, we, we're in the art ecosystem. We have this, you know, this like richness of, um, of excellent statistical methods that are here. Um, let's create a fluent, um, uh, set like like way a fluent way of um, uh, for people to like build their models that um, that they can be effective that they can um, you know be protected against common failure modes that they can uh, be be really um, efficient in their in their workflows and replicable for yeah yes. people working together stuff yes like that. yes <laughs> yes yeah absolutely make sure we yeah. can all, all get the stuff done and all, all yeah. work together yeah uh yeah so uh we chatted with julia and we've selected a, an episode that julia did a few months ago uh that kind of tied into what we've uh done been doing and kind of where we ended up with uh tuning and using workflow sets uh this is going to be more on tuning and how to do that more efficiently um, and because we tend to use uh, sports related data, uh, this one we thought uh, was very appropriate for us to talk about. Uh, Julia, do you want to maybe share your screen? Uh, yes. And so what we're going to be doing is Julia is going to be taking us through how she used XG Boost and predicted home, home runs. Julia, you want to take it away? Yeah, absolutely. So this um, um, this data set is a data set that was from um, the streaming data science competition or competitive data science show that streamed like on um, on. Uh, Twitch. Yes, that's right. Twitch. Yes, yes. Twitch. On yeah. Twitch. I'm like, where was it? Was it yeah. through YouTube? Yes. On Twitch um, this past summer mm -hmm. called Sliced. And so the and the data sets were hosted on Kaggle. And so you actually, if you would like, if you want to go to the URL, you can get this data yourself and play around with it. Um, mm. And so and the, the point of this, our modeling goal here is to predict whether a batter's hit results in a home run. And we have features of the hit. We have information information about the hit so um, the so there is there is a whole video here if you would like to watch it um, um, in it you know if you're like oh, I just can't get enough I want to hear more about this data set. <laughs> it is um, a fantastic <laughs> video by the way everybody you should definitely watch it uh, I rewatched it ahead of ahead of talking with Julia here and I, I learned again more stuff about how all this works so it's very kind. definitely check it's it out and we'll kind. have a link in the description down below that's very kind. Um, okay, so we're going to try to predict whether a hit is a home run. Um, and so we start out uh, loading the data here. So um, like most Kaggle competitions, there's like a training data set. There's two CSVs, a training data set and a test um, CSV. I don't, so in this, in this um, blog post, I don't use the test CSV, it does not have um, the labels on it, like whether it is a, hit, a home run or not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, so in this first section, we go through some exploratory data analysis. Um, <clears throat> you know, exploratory data analysis is such a key, important part of the modeling process. Um, uh, this, I, you know, it, it's a little bit of a cheating here because, um, like, I, this episode of Sliced was one that um, I like. I wasn't on. Like, I didn't participate in it. It was for other sets of competitors, and so I actually had watched it and. Um, um, you know, like had, had seen people use the data set and, you know, make lots of plots. So I, you know, like, like I had come to this data set already with some knowledge and some domain knowledge of what was here. So even this like uh, exploratory data analysis section that I will have here um, really doesn't really reflect like the depth of, um, you know, like everything that I would have known um, uh, here. Mm -hmm. But but let's walk through a few of these plots because like the it's so this these would be like representative of the kind of um, EDA that we need to do um, mm -hmm. before getting started on modeling. Um, I I like this one. I think actually, you know, it's the first plot of the whole the whole blog post. But I think this might be my favorite. This might be my favorite mm -hmm. um, plot of the whole blog post. So it has. Um, 
Uh, it's a plot showing like the physical space around home run. So like the horizontal space and the vertical. Uh, so like plate X and plate Z. So like the vertical and horizontal. And then um, we use sat summary hex here um, to uh, take, it, what it does is it takes the mean of this Z, the Z, um, um, whatever whatever variable we assign to Z, mm -hmm. takes the mean of that. And then we can see here, um, since that is home run is like a zero to one, zero or one, zero or one of whether it's a home run. So what we get here is the percent um, of hits that are home runs in these space. And so you get this like, I just, I just, you know, like this beautiful little gradient that tells us like where there are more home runs and where there are less. So we start off with what I think is probably my favorite. Gotta love these, these are great plot. These are great plots for anybody working uh, with like spatial data uh we did one with nb on the any nba court with uh shot charts but you know soccer data football data anything that's like spatial where there's an event taking place or events taking place this is a pretty cool uh plot to use for sure yeah i like that one Mm -hmm. um, then we go on to this one. So this one um, has got like the launch angle and the launch speed. Mm -hmm. And here you're like, whoa, that's super dramatic. That is super <laughs> dramatic, right? Um, so all the home runs are way up here, way up here. Mm -hmm. um, so... I mean, like, look, look, that's 100%. These are, <laughs> these are all home runs. So if you can, like, hit at this speed, at this angle, it's like, it's going to be a home run, you know? Yeah, like, good job. Let me get I, there. So, like, these, these um, variables were in the training data set as features, but these are so... Um, like highly correlated with home runs that you know like like shit are is this a good machine learning problem or not like i don't know should do we just like use this simple and, linear regression yeah. simple logistic regression yeah <laughs> one yeah. Pretty, darn, pretty darn close yeah or, or you know like an if else statement you know we just like you know <laughs> right. like i don't know i don't know but I don't know, yeah. but but anyway, so we see this and we know it. So we will know. We kind of know going in like what we would expect to see here. So mm -hmm. um, we at least know this, and we're like, well, I better get pretty darn good <laughs> results, right? If I see this, if I put this into some kind of a in kind of a model, mm -hmm. and actually in a real life situation, I probably would train like a super super simple model just on this. Um, maybe, maybe just like a really simple decision tree, right? And that I could literally write out in like if else statements and then, and then see like how much, how much improvement do I get in performance when I add in a bunch of other information? Right. Like, you know, say I add in this information, mm -hmm. I add in the other stuff here, you know, like, like how much improvement do I get? So like that, that's actually something I would do in real life. Yeah. All right, so here here is this last um, exploratory plot um, here. So this is about like the pacing, basically like um, where in the course of a game is a hit happening. So I take um, like balls, strikes, and innings and reshape the data a little bit and then make a plot here so that we can see, compare, um, uh, so this is a density plot here, compare um, the distribution of uh, hits that are not home runs and hits that are um, mm -hmm. over the course, and we see, we see some real differences here, right? Like look look at like balls, strikes, mm -hmm. innings too. You know, like there are some real differences here about when when home runs happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and often histograms are um, count data, but you have density. Can you just walk through the function that allowed you to get the density for all three of those variables? Yes. Yeah. So, and actually this is something I do quite a bit because I often want something that looks like a histogram, but like often the counts are really different from each other. If I had just put counts on here, the home run yes would be way down here at the bottom and like the shapes would be different, but you wouldn't be able to see the difference in the shape. So what right. I really want is like a histogram, but with density on the Y axis. What I like to use for that um, is to come up here on the um, in the Y um, axis part of the aesthetic call, um, and I put um, I you can put, you can use this after stat um, function, and the after stat function lets you put um, 
uh, like a different use a different stat here. So if it normally would be, um, you know, density, and you want to put counts, you know, like you can do that. You basically can say, hey, after after you would do the normal whatever you whatever thing ggplot2 would do here afterwards compute this other stat instead so mm -hmm. here i want to compute density and so you and it makes this plot which i think is does a better job of the thing i want to communicate mm -hmm. yeah. which is say that like um people are more likely to get a strike when they have or mo more likely to get a home run when they have zero strikes than when they have three mm -hmm. right yeah yeah cool yeah, so th so this is this is where I wrapped up EDA um, mm -hmm. in blog posts at least. Yeah, how awesome. much time would you normally spend on EDA before you go into a model like broad stroke? Not, oh, I like... think way longer than this. Way longer than this. I mean, I think so. I think this is short. This is this short. I think because it's a blog post and you know, like a blog post that the the main purpose of it is to talk about you know racing and XG boost, not to talk about this baseball data you know um but yeah no i think um i mean eda eda is oh you, you almost like can't understate the value of eda when it comes to machine learning and modeling because like what you learn during the process of exploratory data analysis um impacts impacts all the decisions you make later on like it yeah. impacts the in in um, typically, typically in ways that set you up for greater success, you know, like it sets you up to understand what kind of decisions you should make in um, resampling, what kind yeah. of decisions you should make in um, feature engineering, what kind of decisions, um, like even even like what kind of decisions should you make in terms of how you should evaluate your model, like what would be a most appropriate metric to use, and and of course you know like what kind of model should you use it, itself, you know like you know we were just saying like oh yeah like let's make a let's make a decision tree with two you know two leaves you know like like you, you, um, all those things are things that you can see and understand when you're going through the process of EDA. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. But since we're just here talking about this blog post, let's move on to building a model um, here in this section. Um, so I so I start by loading tiny models here, you know, mm -hmm. and so tiny models. I you know you all have been talking about this, but it like it's a meta package, right? Like the way Tidyverse is. And so when you load tidy models, it loads a set of packages that um, um, each have like a different purpose. So like when you load Tidyverse and you say, ah, I've loaded Tidyverse, now I can use ggplot2 for um, visualization and dplyr for you know, data manipulation and tidy R for reshaping. So tidy models loads a set of packages that mm -hmm. has like different purposes. And so it's, um, uh, that modularity has actually quite a lot of benefits, both for you and for me, for us. So like packages that are more modular are easier to maintain. Like it's easier to do more frequent releases. It's easier to, um, <clears throat> like it's easier to keep up with like smaller packages and also it makes it easier to um, um, like manage and deploy models when mm -hmm. you're not like okay time for me to <laughs> install this giant package into my docker container or something like you only will need the ones that you need for prediction you don't need mm -hmm. everything that you need for tuning or racing or anything like that so um, this this modularity is something that you know, if you first come to it, you're like, what? What's going on? What are all these packages? But the, it really is something that has payoff both for um, basically for everyone involved here. <laughs> it's all positives. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, so this first bit here, I um, I like to talk about it as like spending your data budget. Thinking about this as spending, spending your data budget. You have a certain amount of data and, you know, pretty much all of us when we are um, – starting any kind of modeling problem, we have a certain amount of data and um, um, we have to decide what are we going to do? How are we going to spend it? What are we going to do? Um, so the first thing do, so I, um, I do a little bit of uh, some 
munging here on the way in, but then I um, split it into testing and training. So this split object um, keeps track of which observations are in training and which observations are in testing. And then these training and testing functions will, you know, call out, will like pull out those, those observations that we need. Mm -hmm. um, here we use stratified um, splitting, stratified resampling, because um, uh, it is in balance. Like uh, if you remember from that first image, there's a lot more hits that are not home runs than are. Um, stratification basically um, never hurts you and often helps. So it's typically a good idea to stratify um, in, in many, if not most situations. Mm -hmm. So then we have our training data here, and with our training data, we can create resampling folds. Um, here I use um, cross-validation, um, mainly, I guess you could say, because it's like a pretty big data set that lets me create resampling folds, or cross-validation folds that are like robust and in good shape. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I do, do it stratified here. So um, what these folds uh, give us are basically like simulated, um, uh, little data sets that are like um, um, simulated versions of our original first training data set. And I can use all these many simulated versions to um, to tune a model, to I can use it to compare models, I can use it to choose models. So I don't want to use the testing data for any of those purposes. Um, the testing data is being held out. Um, the testing data's one purpose is at the very end to estimate performance on new data. All right, sounds good. Yeah. So, so after spending our data budget, the next step to think about is feature engineering or data pre-processing. Mm -hmm. um, in tidy models, um, the feature engineering and data pre-processing concept, um, we, we, we wrap that concept in what we call a recipe. And so the idea here is that you have um, ingredients, who I keep clicking on the wrong part of the mouse, um, ingredients here, and these ingredients, you say, ah, I wanna take these ingredients and I want to put them into my recipe. Here's what belongs in it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to walk through, oh, I must, my mouse is going crazy. Um, <laughs> and then I'm going to go through and add these steps mm -hmm. to um, the recipe. And then um, I can, um, then I'll take some training data. I, I do, you do pass in some training data here. Mm -hmm. And the, I can use the training data to estimate any parameters that I need to. Like here I'm doing some imputation, mm -hmm. um, like actually like training some little linear models to do imputation with and whatnot. And um, so the, the feature engineering recipe is estimated with training data. And then later I can apply it, this recipe now that's prepared, I can apply it to any other data, like the testing data or new data data at protection time, and it will use the values that were estimated with the training data. <clears throat> In tiny models, we think it's really important to think about your feature engineering, your data pre-processing as part of the modeling process. Like, mm -hmm. is, is modeling just like, like estimating the parameters of some kind of learner, like say like the SG, XGBoost parameters? We really think it's important to realize that's not the case. If you've got feature engineering, um, that has some values in there that you have to learn from. It's not like you, you don't just estimate that like one time with all your data or with your train with the training data one time. Like it actually is part of the, the model as a whole or your modeling process as a whole. And if you're tuning or comparing or choosing, you have to realize that <clears throat> data leakage can happen in feature engineering just as easily as it can during model estimation. And, and I think we, we, um, we have, you know, the machine learning community <clears throat> has a fair bit of maturity and understanding about da uh, data leakage when it comes to like estimating the parameters of a model. Like people know like, oh yeah, I'm not supposed to send all my model or all my data to XGBoost. Mm -hmm. Like I know that will mess me up, right? But it actually is the same, that's the same problem when it comes to feature engineering. Mm -hmm. You have to consider that as like part of your data. So if you're gonna do resampling, you have to resample your feature engineering as well. Mm -hmm. mm. 
Gotcha. So this is what a recipe looks like. You can use these, um, you know, these selectors that look kind of like tidy select selectors. Mm -hmm. um, you can, so here, like what this means here is I'm going to impute any missing data with the median value for that column for all numeric predictors except not these two. So if you remember, these were the two I knew were super important mm -hmm. because of from that plot. And so what this one is doing is I'm saying, okay, when these are missing, I, wanna, I want to um, create a linear model for each one where I'm going to impute it with these three things. So there were, there were some missing data in, in these two. And remember how important they were? So if I want to be able to um, make a prediction, uh, so what do I do? I can either like take those out of my training data, which it turns out they were missing for a fair amount. So mm -hmm. I can either take them out of my training data or I can try to impute that missing data. Mm -hmm. So here what I decided to impute with was with the X and Y and how fast the pitch was. Mm -hmm. um, so so these, so everything else that was numeric gets just gets imputed with the median. And then these two that I know were so important get imputed with a linear model. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. Um, one other just thing to note here is, um, so XGBoost requires only numeric um, uh, predictors. It can't handle any, um, you know, any factors or strings or anything. So you have to convert everything that is, anything that is nominal has to be converted to a dummy or indicator variable. Mm -hmm. And with XGBoost, we, pr we want to use... Um, it's, it's, you might just get a little bit extra kick of in performance by using one hot equals true. So in R, you're probably used to seeing factor variables where it's like if you had like red, blue, green, when you train a model at the end, like LM, you'll, you won't see blue, I guess, because blue is the lowest in the first in the yeah. alphabet, right? You'll just mm -hmm. see red and green. Um, that's because you've created dummy. It has automatically created this indicator variable for you, and it considered that the base level. And with a, with the kind of math that happens in a linear model, you can't have all three in there. You can't do that math. You have to take one out as the base level. Well, a tree-based model doesn't work like that. A tree-based model, you can have them all in there, and that's what one hot equals true says. It's like put them all in because and because of the way um, like uh, the branches in these tree-based models can work, it you can sometimes get slightly better results by putting um, all the levels in. Mm -hmm. It's kind of keeping all the information in the data as opposed to like implying that this is the baseline. If, if yes. those are zero, then that's then that's obviously one. Here you're yeah, yeah. explicitly telling the model, no, that is one. Yeah, yeah. Be and it's it's just because of the way um the like the branching works in mm -hmm. a tree. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so this is feature engineering. And I, I do actually show here prepping it. Um we don't we don't have to do this, but basically I often will when I'm training a model just to make sure it runs without errors that things that are, it's like, is this working? You know, is this working? Um, I don't have to because I'm going to be putting it into a tidy models workflow that mm -hmm. handles it at, like handles all that for me. Mm -hmm. But I'm just doing this to make sure that it runs. Gotcha. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So that's uh, the feature engineering. And then now we need to work, let's think about the model. Like what kind of learner do we want to use? We're, mm -hmm. we're doing XGBoost here mm -hmm. um, because um, this is, you know, the kind of data that works very well with XGBoost. If you watched Sliced last summer or if you come back and watch it later, you'll notice that it's like XGBoost all the time. <laughs> all XGBoost all the time. And that's because like these data sets are these like dense tabular data that have, you know, a couple hundred thousand or a couple tens of thousands rows and XGBoost tends to be extremely effective in those contexts. It's mm -hmm. not that XGBoost is the best and only, you know, model <laughs> that you ever need to know, but yeah. it's just it just it just works very well in that particular kind of context. Mm -hmm. So XGBoost has a ton of hyperparameters. Um, I don't know, like seven or and then there's like more that you could put down here in the engine. Um, there, there's maybe like six, six ones that, that tidy models kind of in an opinionated way things are the main ones, the important mm -hmm. ones. And then there are some that you could put here, here in the engine, mm -hmm. in the set engine call that are maybe, you know, we think are maybe a little less important. But yeah. um, here okay. um, I tune, oh gosh, uh, here I tune um, 
three that I think are probably the most important. And I, I set my learning rate kind of medium to high. This is kind of high, kind of a high learning rate for XG Boost. Uh-huh. But, but it basically says, like, please train faster. <laughs> <laughs> Gets where we're going to. We'll just, just put the gas down a little bit more. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah. So, so it, um, if I were going to try to get, like, even better results, I could try to tune the learning rate. I could try to tune more things here. Um, that are in the in the boost tree um, mm-hmm. to tune more hyperparameters. Mm-hmm. So so hyperparameters are you know like 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 in um, in LM you know or in a linear model or in many models there's like parameters that you can learn while you're training the data. In in uh, XGBoost model there's a bunch of parameters that you cannot learn when you're training the data. You have to just say say them ahead of time. And so those are the things called hyperparameters. And so that's what these all are. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we put these things together, together into a workflow. So a workflow is just like a convenient um, container for carrying around bits of modeling pieces. So mm-hmm. we right now we contain we put in our feature engineering recipe and our modeling, um, our our model specification. This is what we call them, mm-hmm. and so it is it is ready to go. Haha, cool. sweet. But I, I couldn't actually just fit this to data because of because these I don't have um, parameters in there. They just set to tune. Mm-hmm. If I tried to fit this to training data, it would error because it'd be like you haven't told me how many trees you want me to put into this XGBoost model. Mm-hmm. So I, I couldn't actually fit this, but I can tune it. Ooh. And so that's the last section here in this, um, in this blog post. And that is about tuning XGBoost and specifically using racing to mm-hmm. tune XGBoost. So this um, requires the use of one more package. So fine tune is part of tidy models, but it's not part of the core tidy models. So like um, like in tidyverse, if you've ever been like, oh, I'm using tidyverse, but I do have to go and add this other package that you know like is developed by tidyverse developers, but it's not like part of the core. Like glue is an example. You know, mm-hmm. like ah oh, yeah, like. I know about glue. Glue comes from the same people, but it's not part of like the core um, tidyverse. So this, that's similar to what um, fine tune is. Mm-hmm. And so fine tune lets you basically have these drop-in replacement functions that instead of saying like tune grid here, instead we say tune race, and then um, and then a way to do the ra- racing. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, looks like we lost oh, Patrick. No. So, uh, he'll he'll get back, I'm sure. Uh, okay. So we'll just, so we'll we'll say, just continue on without him. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hopefully he'll rejoin us. So we'll say tune race here. And so um, what we put here in for the arguments are the the workflow, um, the resamples that we'll use to do the um, to do the evaluating. How many different? Uh, my mm-hmm. gosh. How many different grid points we want to try to evaluate? Um, you know, what metrics are we going to evaluate on? Mm-hmm. And then a little bit of like some uh, just, you know, control, like, like, hey, tell me a little bit about this. Yeah. And um, I'm using Tune Race Anova here, which is a good, a good thing to start with. Mm-hmm. Is there a reason you used uh, like Tune Race? Like what other types of racing are there? So Fine Tune right now has three options for um, racing for tune for racing methods for tune for tuning and Mm -hmm. um anova i think is a good one to um get familiar with and start with and it really is it does literally use an anova so um so this is the results here so let's let's talk about this plot Mm -hmm. and um what like what this means so there i said grid 15 which means um hey try 15 possible values of these um, these three things that need to be tuned. Mm-hmm. I want you to pick 15 possible values, and it will it will put them on a uh, a non regular grid, like a space filling grid. Mm-hmm. Um, pick reasonable values for me. 15 of them. Go try it. 
<clears throat> notice that the resamples I had, we had uh, cross validation folds, there were 10 of them. So we have, um, so we'll have 10 chances to um, try these 15 um, possible uh, model parameter sets. So the way Tune Race Nova works is it says, okay, um, let's try them all and let's, let's, uh, let's try them all and let's do it for, um, I think here it tried them for three, for three of the resamples, it tried them all. And then mm -hmm. it uses an ANOVA to compare them and, and like look and say like, hey, statistically, do they, do they look different? Mm -hmm. Do I see any evidence, do I see statistical evidence that they look, that any of these look different? And so you can look at this plot and you're like, wow, yep, yep. <laughs> it is <Whoa>. clear. <laughs> it Whoa. is clear that these top, you know, um, you know, 10 or so are much worse, are much worse than these bottom ones. So mm -hmm. a whole bunch of them get thrown away right away um, after the initial evaluation. Mm -hmm. But it looks like this blue line, and maybe there's even another one in there, looked... Um, uh, looked really close, and so there um, there was not enough evidence to throw those away after three, but once you got to four, there was enough evidence, and said, ah, oh, okay, well, now I have enough evidence. Let's throw that one away too. It's worse. Mm -hmm. It's worse than the the best one. Gotcha. And so that's how Tune Race ANOVA works. It's like it's using um, ANOVA, like using an ANOVA to like compare them and see um, uh, like do I see if they're different or not. Mm -hmm. the, there's two other methods um, in um, to fine tune right now. The first one is um, called Tune Tune um, race win loss, I think, mm -hmm. and or I think yeah, I've got them right, right here. It's about um, Bradley. It uses the Bradley Terry um, algorithm, the method to make um, games like where mm -hmm. they play each other, and mm -hmm. they basically like where where one XG boost parameter set plays the other actually boost parameter set and say like, who wins and so you use the Bradley Terry algorithm to set up you know games and say who wins and loses against who and mm -hmm. so we can then say who is the overall winner so you oh, don't have yeah. to have everyone play everyone um, to be able to see who is the winner so mm -hmm. the win loss one tune race win loss is one and then the last one is um, uses simulated annealing mm -hmm. which is a a like um uh, uh, an algorithm for optimization where you like move a little bit and try things around that area and then you know which way to move and then you try a little bit around that area and then you keep moving all around. So these are these like, there, it's like different um, um, optimization methods for like finding um, a way to uh, find the best answer. Um, mm -hmm. And actually XGBoost is a really good algorithm with which to use racing because the parameters in XGBoost are not, um, they're not like physically meaningful or like they're not like um, meaningful in the, to the problem that you're trying to find usually, you know, and like this is different than many, than other kinds of models like, um, <clears throat> You know, like a, like a linear model, often you're like, oh, yeah, like the coefficient that I get out of it, it's really telling me something. You know, it's telling me, is it, go, is it getting bigger or smaller? Mm -hmm. um, how, how much bigger or smaller? Like, that's telling you something. The para like the parameters in uh, like an XGBoost model, um, it, it's not really telling you anything. So you might end up with, like, say, two combinations of some values here that perform about the same and there's mm. not really a reason to choose one or the other like there's mm. no there's no good, good reason if one has a bunch of trees and one has a few trees but like different values of m try there's no really any reason to tr choose one over the over the other mm -hmm. per se so um racing is a really good fit for xgboost because you can you're like try a bunch throw a bunch away and then just like keep going, you know, with like, until you find the ones that, that are a good fit. Gotcha. Oh, cool. Thank you.
Um, so this, so we have these like helper functions to dealing with racing, like make a nice default plot. That data is in there that you can get it out and make any kind of custom plot that you want. Um, this will say, hey, what is actually the best? Like show me the best one. Mm -hmm. So this is this, this green line down here, you know, like this is, this is that result here. Mm -hmm. And once we have, so once we know like, hey, this is, this is the one I want, that's the one I want to use, then we can update that original workflow we had with these, um, with these parameters. Mm -hmm. So um, if we say, hey, I want to go to that, um, that result that I have, choose the best one out, select the best one out um, uh, according to the metric that I'm using. And then I can take my original workflow that I had and um, <clears throat> um, finalize it. This means update those parameters that were tuning parameters, update them with these values, mm -hmm. you know, six, this many trees, this number for min n and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then we can just pipe that straight into this last fit function. So last fit is a convenience function that will say, um, hey, I want to fit one time to the training data and evaluate one time on the testing data. Mm -hmm. Notice that what we pass in here is the split, the split that tells us which observations are the training data and the testing data. Mm -hmm. So this, this is something, you know, you can do this you know, manually, you know, like, hey, I want to fit to the training data. I want to predict on the testing data. But, but um, uh, this is just available as something to do it, you know, faster and more conveniently. But it's not nothing. Nothing fancy is going on under the under the hood. It's just mm -hmm. like fit and then predict on these on these different pieces. Gotcha. And if the test data was uh, of an external source, uh, and or you're trying to productionalize this model. Um, what is it from the from the finalized workflow you, that you would need to save and then you know productionalize like you bring in test data and make sure that the workflow runs over that new data etc because right now it's splitting on data that you already had access to you, you yes. put into your data budget so to speak yes yes that's a great point so if you had this object um this it's printing out here notice and it's got like you know the metrics from the the testing data and these predictions are from the testing data and it has this the workflow is in there right mm -hmm. this is now the fit the fitted workflow the trained workflow mm -hmm. so you can you can like do dollar sign dot workflow and like pull it all out manually with like a two brackets and all that but there is a function that's called um, extract workflow so you can you can call extract workflow on this and that will give you a train workflow and you can you know save that you can put that into you know production somewhere um, you can also you can call predict on that so you mm -hmm. say predict on that model object with any any new data like say that <clears throat> from Kaggle, they give you that, like, what they call test CSV that doesn't have any labels on it. So you can call predict on that, um, on, on the model with that test data. And then you'll get um, a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, predictions. You'll get your predicted labels. In this case, it would be, is it a home run or not? Is it a home run or not? And when you save that workflow, uh, like if I was saving it, any model, if I was just running it in its native package, like a random forest or XG boost, I might save my final model that I've built as like an RDS file. Is that what you recommend saving the workflow as? Yes, yes. Uh, I would save the workflow as an RDS. Yes, that's what I would recommend. Because these are like R objects. You would want to save it as like a binary okay. R object. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. So in these results, um, we can do, you know, we, we, there's a lot of stuff in here actually that you can do to kind of get to these like final evaluation kind of stages. Um, so there, these pr predictions are here. And again, you could like manually get them out, but we have like a, a function here to make that more fluent and convenient. You can collect those predictions and then you could do things like you can make a confusion matrix, you can make an ROC curve. Um, here I show how to compute the log loss, the mean log loss, mm -hmm. because that's actually what that competition was being judged on. Mm -hmm. And um, and this this ended up being um, like like pretty good, you know, like compared to what people got um, that night at the competition. Um, yeah. They uh, probably if you wanted to do better, you would want to um, uh, train several XGBoost models and ensemble them together. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> and the package for that in Tidy Models is called Stacks. Stacks. <clears throat> Stacks, which is also very great and cool. works very well. <laughs> and then I think um, then this last thing that I have here in this um, blog post is um, variable importance. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, here, I show it right here. Extract workflow. There you go. Oh, there you so, go. Yeah, yeah. So we extract workflow. We get out that thing. And then um, the the variable importance from the VIP package actually works on the model that's inside inside of the workflow. Remember, the workflow has the feature engineering and the model inside of it. Mm -hmm. And it turns out this this function acts on the model. Um, oh, I wonder if we changed that. Anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, so you call VIP here, and we get out this result. Mm -hmm. And look at that. What a shock! <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? <laughs> so that like that launch speed and launch angle, they are far and away the most important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then they, you know the things after that, like they make sense too, right? Like that next one is ground ball. You know, so it's like if if the pitch is a ground ball, that's very important to whether a hit is a. Um, home run or not mm -hmm. you know we're like yep okay okay yep, you know yep. like that makes sense um and then we see you know fly ball and then we see these things like um like the x and y information is important and line drive is here and whatnot mm -hmm. so we see all this variable importance information there you go and then you could start yeah. to use that to maybe to inform some decisions or tell other people like hey these are the things that will impact your home run hitting yeah. abilities yeah things to take Take into consideration. Yeah. Yeah. And since it is a tree model, um, like a, tr a model made of many trees that are all like vote, you know, voting, mm -hmm. um, we don't, you know, we don't have any information overall aggregated if it's, you know, is it like pushing it yes or no? Like mm -hmm. we just know overall if it's important or not. Yes. Um, so that's what, that's what variable importance means for a tree-based model. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be different if we were looking at a linear model where like the structure inside of it would tell us, um, yeah. would tell us like, is it positive or negative? How big is it? You know, all we get is this um, importance, yes or no kind of um, measure. But there are ways to um, get that information out. It's just that um, it's not it's not as simple as just like give me the variable importance. <laughs> Instead, you need to do things like um, compute um, uh, compute uh, what are called partial dependence profiles. Mm -hmm. So saying like, hey, um, holding everything else about an observation constant. What happens if we change? you know you know like f from ground ball to not ground ball or you know like yeah. what what will happen and we'll mm. be able to say does it make it a home run or a not home run gotcha. like i think i think i've got it pulled up right here like here's an example of a partial dependence plot for a um a linear uh uh regression model so mm. if we're computing the price here these are these are houses and yeah. so it's like how old when was the house built and how old is that or how, how expensive is the house yeah and so we have all these gray lines are individual observations and so what we're doing is we're saying okay for this house that i have if it was older or younger what does the model say its price will be and then we go to the next house okay this house if it's older or younger, what does this model say the house will be? So you actually use the model and you're basically like poking at it with all your data, <laughs> but changing things about your data. So you say you have your, your real data, right? But you say, okay, I've got this house in my data set. What if I change the age of this house? Mm -hmm. um, and you make predictions. So you get these all these little gray lines, yeah. which are um, partial dependence profiles. And then you can aggregate up to understand the behavior of the model overall. So this is um this one is actually a random forest model, not an XGBoost model, but so pretty similar, you know, into how how it works. Mm -hmm. So this blue line is the overall behavior of the model um, uh, with year and um, sale price. Gotcha. And and like the great thing about partial dependence profiles is you can aggregate them up in different ways. So like this, so we aggregate it up here by the kind of house it is. So yeah. is it like a duplex, a one family, is it a townhouse? And you can see like, hey, do these, you know, do we see dramatic differences in the behavior here or are they all kind of similar or mm -hmm. whatever? Gotcha. Anyway, anyway, right. so that's, that's like when we look at this and we say like, oh, what, what do you mean ground ball 
you know, like, what, what do I know about it? You, all we know about it from variable importance is that it is very important. You know, not necessarily <laughs> yeah. if it's like home run or not home run. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Exactly. Definitely. Exactly. All right, cool. Yeah, so that's that's it. That's the blog post. Awesome. Well, thank you. I know uh, I learned a lot, you know, talking with you, yeah, watching sure. your, your screencast and whatnot. Um, is somebody that was coming into data science wanting to learn how to use tidy models and uh, start using this in their everyday work, where would you suggest they start? So I think the best place to start is at tidymodels.org slash start. So um, there's a lot of different... Um, so when I started working on tidy models, actually, I felt like like we were a little low on documentation, um, but I feel like we've gotten to a pretty good place mm. and um, that we have a lot more um, options now for people to get information and figure out where things are. And um, that, I think, is probably the best place if someone's like... I, I'm like, I'm just new. I want to figure out where things are. <clears throat> Those are, there's like, um, a four or five articles that are meant to like start you at the beginning, step you through, introduce you to the concepts that um, like underlie um, this framework of like how to get started with modeling. So um, tidymodels.org slash start would be the best place to get started for. We'll include a link down below. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. awesome. Uh, Patrick, do you have any questions? Uh, the only question I have is uh, you mentioned something in uh, in there about being able to build ensemble models in in the tidy models framework and you mentioned the stacks package. My question with that more selfishly than anything is do you have a blog post on stacks or where oh, uh, or will you be question. doing one or is I, there <laughs> yeah I think I do let's see uh I think I've got one out there. I'm not totally sure, actually. There are some good um, materials um, uh, on how to get started with it on on the package down site, um, and and really, if you um, if you have gotten familiar with uh, tidy models, it does feel quite fluent to like keep going with stacks. Like it fits really beautifully into the ecosystem. You know, you if you've trained, um, if you've trained like and tuned workflows, you then you're like, oh, they'll, they just go into a stack and the stack will, and then you, when you like, you do what's called like blend predictions and it will like find which what, which of them should it keep to do a better job there. So it um, it is pretty user-friendly to be able to get started is, with stacks. And is it a package that's loaded with tidy models or we have to load it separate? You would load it, you would load it. So it's not one of the core tidy models packages, it's like oh, fine okay. tune. It's like oh, fine cool. tune mm, in that yeah. you would say library stacks to get started. But it and is it, part of tidy models. S-T-A-C-K-S all under, uh, under yeah. case. Yes. Okay. yes. Cool. Yeah. 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 No, yeah I've, heard that, I've heard a fair amount about that package. And I guess awesome. we're, we're now getting close to an hour. So let's uh, let's wrap up here with one final question, okay. which is what did, uh, I guess if you could tell our listeners anything, what would you tell them? Hmm. So, okay. So here's what I'd say. Um, so uh, machine learning and modeling is, um, is, is, it's frankly, I think like, is not what most data scientists get the most, um, bang for your buck from in in the li in your line of work you know like like we often spend most of our time um, and end up seeing most of our impact from things a little bit earlier in like the sort of process like really understanding what data is there like like a little more straightforward um, <clears throat> relationships however um, for most people to be able to um, advance in their careers, it is super important to have these kinds of skills um, in your toolkit, to be able to um, at least to know where to go, to be able to um, uh, kind of attack one of these tasks, to be able to get started one with one of these tasks. So I think that it's really good to have like the right balance when we think about machine learning and modeling, that for most people, most most people, most of their time is spent on, you know, preparing data, understanding data, deeply um, uh, um, exploring data. <clears throat> and, and, and you bring huge value to your organizations when you do those. However, these machine learning and modeling skills um, are 
Uh, although they're not always what we spend the most time on in terms of the, we spend the most you know time on by proportion they 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 really are i think <clears throat> uh be, be like qu quite necessary often for like advancing in career or advancing to that next job that you want and so being able to um have some like uh ah yeah i know where to go to be able to learn how to do x i know what book to pick up or what website to go to to be able to do that so that's what i would say is like let's have it's good to have like the right uh, a, a attitude about these kinds of tasks importance not that they're like the only thing I ever do and I don't feel good about myself unless I'm doing it you know but yeah. that like yeah no I need to know I need to hold in balance how important these kind of skills are oh that is incredibly insightful that's awesome and yeah. I think our, our viewers are gonna love this uh, so with that let's end the episode here thank you so much for joining us Julia as yeah. always my name is Ellis Hughes you can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes and my name is Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick, and you can find the screencast on Twitter at, at tidy underscore explained, tidy.explained at gmail.com. You can email us, like and subscribe on the YouTube channel, uh, drop us a comment there. And our guest today, Julia Silgi, you can find her at? Um, on Twitter at Julia Silgi. So my last name is S I L G E, and my website, juliasilgi.com. Right. It's a great website to get information. It's awesome. I use it all the time. So hopefully others will too. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank Thanks. you so much. And uh, everyone keep on exploring your world.